Music stopped, it must be ready for us to start. Welcome to Kotlin Under the Hood. I think it's called Uncovered, but it's called something. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm Chet Haas, I'm on the Android Developer Relations team. And I'm Romain Guy, I'm on the Android Toolkit team. And once upon a time, we gave a talk called Kotlin Under the Hood, Kotlin Under the Covers, called many, many, many things. Um, and we consider this to be a sequel to that talk. So same idea, different features about Kotlin and how they actually work under the hood. All right, so everything we're going to talk about today is based on Kotlin 1.3.61. Uh, things will probably change in the future. Actually, we're going to mention some of that. Definitely. So if you watch this talk in a couple of years, please don't get mad on Reddit, uh, calling us idiots or something. Things will oh, change. Wait, wait, wait. Reddit, not getting mad. <laughs> That's, That's true. Pretty sure it's a requirement. Yeah, that doesn't work. Anyway, so uh, in this talk, what we do is we look at some of the language uh, features of Kotlin and we inspect what the compiler does. So how do we do that? Uh, here's a very simple example. This is just a hello world. We have a main function we call print line. So how do you go from that to understanding what the compiler does? There are several tools you can use. The first one is IntelliJ itself or Android Studio. When you have your source code uh, loaded in the editor, you can click in the Tools menu, in the Kotlin submenu, and they show Kotlin bytecode. So that's the panel that you can see on the right. It will show you the Java bytecode generated from the current file. You can also click the Decompile button at the top, and you will regenerate Java source code from the bytecode. Bytecode is fairly easy to read, but it can be a little tedious, especially once you start using very complex features like coroutines, for instance. Uh, instead of trying to figure out what, what the bytecode is doing, just click the Decompile button. Now, uh, it doesn't always work uh, to keep the example of coroutines. If you try to decompile coroutine code, chances are the ID will go into an infinite loop. Uh, so just don't, call the <laughs> don't touch the button. Uh, and a lot of code, like synthetic classes, synthetic fields, sometimes don't show up in this regenerated Java source code. So if you really want to know what's going on, you can use a couple of other tools. The first one is called Java P. This is part of the, uh, of the Open JDK. Um, so you can pass a couple flags. Dash C will decompile the code, and dash P will make sure that you see all the private methods and all the private fields. You just list the classes you want to decompile, and you're going to see this kind of output. Uh, so for every method, every class, you're going to see all the bytecode. Of course, like, like I said, bytecode can be a little tedious to read. So I can recommend another uh, tool. It's called Procyon. Uh, if you are on macOS, you can use Homebrew to install that decompiler. And when you invoke it on the command line, so you call, just call Procyon dash decompiler, and you list your classes. And you get not only Java source code, but it's even syntax highlighted uh, in the console, which is really nice and makes the, the, the whole process that much easier. Uh, so we use decompilation bytecode and Java decompilation for most of what we're talking about. But I also found that actually breakpoints work pretty well for understanding what's going on as well. Some of the property stuff uh, and reflection stuff I'm going to talk about later, the implementation of what was actually going on was not in the bytecode specifically in the code that I wrote. Instead, it was in library functions. There were somewhere else in the library, and there was a lot of delegation to other objects, and it was a little difficult to find out who was doing what. But putting a breakpoint in your code and figuring out how you got there was pretty key to understanding what was actually happening in Kotlin. Uh, the first feature we are going, going to talk about is assertions, and we're going to compare them to Java assertions. So here's a very simple example. I have this draw bitmap function. It takes a bitmap. Uh, and to keep the example simple, our drawing will just be a print, uh, print line command uh, in the console. Uh, and here I call the assert function that comes standard with, uh, with Kotlin. And my assertion is this is bitmap opaque function. So we assume that this is going to be a heavy operation. And actually, this is the implementation of my uh, is bitmap opaque function. It goes over every pixel in the bitmap. It checks the alpha channel. And if, the, if one of them is not uh, completely opaque, then we return false. So it doesn't really matter. The, the, the point here is that we're doing something very, very uh, time consuming uh, in our assertion. And then we can write the same example in Java this time. So instead of using the assert function, Java comes with an assert keyword. We still use this uh, is, bitmap is bitmap opaque function. So I wrote it in Java here. It does the exact same thing. And now to compare them, uh, I just call the function draw bitmap a thousand times on a large bitmap. And we're just going to measure how long it takes. So with the Java programming language, it takes 0 0.014 uh, seconds. So it's really fast. Our drawing of the bitmap is really, really quick. And the same code in Kotlin takes almost four seconds. Um, it's much, much slower. 
Now, if we enable assertions, because assertions are disabled by default in the VM, you have to pass this dash EA flag uh, to, to make them actually do something, then Java takes as much time as Kotlin. So what is going on? So if we look at the decompiled code, um, so this is the code that's generated by Java C, the Java compiler, you can see that the first thing it does is it checks whether assertions are enabled or not. And if assertions are enabled, then it does the expensive uh, call to is bitmap, bitmap opaque. And if that fails, of course, we throw an error. Now, the, the code generated by the, the Kotlin compiler is a little different. It first makes the expensive call, then it checks if the assertions are enabled. Oops. <laughs> Uh, and if we look at the implementation of the assert function in the Kotlin standard library, this is how it's written. So it does check that whether or not assertions are enabled, but it receives your assertion as a value, as a Boolean value. So at that time, since it's already a result value, the call has already been made, and you've already lost you know, the, the concept of having assertions enabled only in release builds. Uh, so you can fix that yourself. Uh, you can write this code here. If you look at the, 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 the Java class object, there's this method called desired assertion status. It will tell you whether or not assertions are enabled at runtime. Then you can write your own assert function. And instead of taking a Boolean value, you can take a lambda that returns a Boolean. And that way, we'll defer the execution of the assertion check, and we won't suffer the performance issues. So we can rewrite our draw bitmap uh, method function this way. We just pass our lambda. We still call this bitmap opaque. And if we run that, we get the same uh, performance speed as we get with Java when assertions are disabled. All right, the second feature we want to talk about is the spread operator. So the spread operator is related to var args. So this is a very simple function. It takes a variable number of arguments. They are strings. We just capitalize every string, and then we print them. Nothing very interesting. And this is a how you call a var arg function. So you can pass uh, multiple parameters, as many as you want. And if you decompile the code, you see that the print names function becomes this invoke static here. And if you look at the signature uh, that's in the, the comment, you can see there's this square bracket at the beginning. It means that we are, the, the function is now expecting an array of strings. So every time you, you specify that you're receiving var args, you're actually receiving an array, which means that you call, when you call print names with Jake and JC, the compiler will create an array on your behalf. So that's all fine. Uh, but if the function takes an array, what happens if we create the array? So the compiler doesn't have to. So here, I change the code. I call array of uh, to create the array myself. And then I want to pass this, the array to the function. You, can't, you, can't, you cannot pass the array directly, because your var args could be a var arg of arrays. So to work around that in Kotlin, there's this spread operator. So if you look at the names variable here, there's this little star at the beginning. You're telling the compiler, yeah, this is an array. I just want you to take every member of the array and make it a parameter of the function. And if you look at the generated code, uh, the code generated by the Kotlin compiler, we can see that our array of names is created as we expect. Uh, but we have this new call to arrays.copy of. Uh, this is actually very important because this array could be used in other places in your code. So this makes sure that the function that you're calling is not going to modify the array or that the calling code is not going to modify the array while the callee is trying to do something with it. So what if we try to be smart and do the copy of ourselves? Uh, so here I have my, my array of names. And I call the spread operator, but I do the copy of myself. Uh, so if we look at the generic code, we get this. Not only do we still have the copy of uh, generated by the compiler, we also have a is not null check, uh, because for some reason, the Kotlin doesn't know that when you copy a non-null array, you get a non-null array. So it just, just wants to make really sure that the, the result is not null. So now instead of having one copy, we have two copies. So we had three array allocations uh, just to call this function. And finally, we can make the example a little more complicated. We can uh, interleave a spread with regular uh, parameters. Uh, so here we have an array of names again. Uh, and then I call print names and add uh, Chet's name and my own name, because uh, we're really vain. And we put the spread in the middle. Uh, the code looks very different. It's a, it's a lot more complicated. So now we have this spread builder that appears. The, the free floating parameters are added directly to the spread builder. And then the, the array of names that we created is added as a spread. So the question here is, how many allocations are we doing? So we have two that are very obvious. We have the spread builder, and we have the string array at the end, because our print names function still needs an array of strings. But the spread builder itself contains an array list, and array list contains an object array. So now we have four allocations. All right, next up is tail rec. Uh, tail rec stands for tail recursion. Um, so when you write a recursive function, it is said to be tail recursive when the, the, there's only one recursive call, and that call is the last instruction uh, that's part of the function. This is very important in a number of languages, uh, compilers or interpreters. 
because you can rewrite automatically a tail recursive function in an iterative manner. Um, making a recursive call can be expensive because you have to create a new frame on the stack, you have to st save parameters, you have to make a function call, that can lead to stack overflows, stuff like that. So um, in languages, especially like Lisp functional programming languages where recursion is very common, this is a very fundamental optimization. So this is an example of a tail recursive function. Uh, it just computes the nth number of the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, you can see there's only one recursive call, and it's at the end of the function. It is a tail recursive function. Um, unfortunately, when you use Kotlin JVM, um, the JVM itself will not do this optimization automatically. So it will see this recursion, and it will not turn it into a loop. It will not produce an iterative version. It's actually very easy to verify. Uh, if you call the function with the, the parameter 40,000, we're going to make 40,000 recursive calls. And on my Mac Pro, when I was testing that, I get a stack overflow error. Um, so Kotlin has this really cool feature that the Terrec operator, uh, all you have to do is add it at the beginning of the function. Uh, and when you recompile the code, the code will turn into this. So this is the only feature of the Kotlin language that I can think of uh, that changes the way the, the code is generated. So you can actually tell the compiler, no, no I want you to optimize that. Um, it would be better if it was done by the runtime, by the VM itself. I just wanted to mention it because this is a very powerful optimization, and it's easy to forget that it's there in Kotlin. How powerful it is? Uh, so here's a little benchmark. Um, so the original recursive function uh, in my benchmark takes two and a half seconds. And by just adding tail rec to the declaration, it now takes only 0 0.3 seconds. So it's a 8.5 times speed up by just adding that one keyword. All right, so in the prequel to this talk, uh, I talked about a feature for using lazy, which is a really convenient way for deferring, creating things until you actually need the things, which is convenient for expensive things. Uh, the implementation of how that thing actually works is dependent upon how property delegation works, which is dependent upon how properties work, which is also related to how reflection works. And I thought, why don't we look at that entire stack? So I want to talk about some of those things now. So uh, here's some simple code that I wrote by my very own self. Uh, so reflection test, we declare a property, and we have a couple of functions in there. And I wanted to see what was going on when we try to use Java reflection. Like, well, there is an entire reflection API, so why do we actually need uh, Kotlin reflection? So let's see what it looks like at the Java level and then at the Kotlin level. So we'll put that over there and say, OK, Java reflection, we use the normal class and field and method stuff. And we basically say, OK, what are all the fields and methods going on in this simple code here? And we have a field, which is a private field, which doesn't exist at the Kotlin level, right? So this is basically as it compiles down into the Java uh, programming language class files, it needs to convert to things that Java understands. So we no longer have a property. We have a private field and then a getter and setter associated with that. So this all makes sense, right? This is how properties work under the hood. But if you're using reflection, you don't want to end up using the way things are implemented rather than, like, why don't we actually use the language features? Can't we access things as properties instead of as private fields uh, and getters and setters? So if instead we look at the way Kotlin Reflection works, it builds on top of Java Reflection, but adds capabilities and APIs that are more specific to the language features that Kotlin has. So if we go through and say, what are all the functions and properties here, then we get what we expect. And there's actually an, an int property. And then we can deal directly with the property instead of through this indirect mechanism that we need to if we're dealing with Java Reflection. All right, so we can create an instance of this reflection test, and then we can uh, get references to the functions and sort of see what those look like under the hood. So let's put that over there and say, OK, we can create an instance, which looks like this. Uh, and then it creates an instance of this class, right? So it creates an inner class with a few methods on it, including an invoke method, right? So automatically, off off the cuff, it's going to create this uh, instance of a class, and it's going to put a method in there, which is a way for it to sort of get the value on the fly. So we create a reference to this thing by that very handy colon colon operator. Then we have uh, a reference to it, and we can call it directly by passing in a parameter inside parentheses. There are different ways that you can call this. This is one of them. You can call it directly. You can call invoke, and you can call call. Uh, but this is one of them. So this ends up, when you just call it directly, it ends up being an invoke call. It's basically an alias to an invoke call. And that invoke goes directly into the inner class instance that we created, which goes to the getter. Um, so all pretty straightforward. Uh, if instead we call invoke directly, that does essentially the same thing. The interesting thing to note here is that it creates 
yet another instance of yet another uh, class, right? So instead of creating one thing that everybody uses, it sort of creates these on the fly. So every time you use that colon colon, it's going to create an instance of that class along the way. So now we see how we can invoke and call this thing in different ways. So given the reference that we created before, we can call invoke on it, which ends up in that method inside that uh, inner class instance that we saw. Uh, or we can call call on it, which is basically, it looks synonymous because we're basically passing with another parameter. This gets auto-boxed into an object array. Uh, and then we can even call it with a nonsense number of parameters. So I can call this thing that took one int, uh, and I can call it with two ints instead. This does not result in a build error, and instead results in a runtime error. So there's clearly something different going on between invoke, which calls directly into that, uh, that function, that instance of that inner class that we saw, versus this call mechanism. We'll see how this actually works later when we talk about properties. Speaking of properties, let's talk about how property reflection works. So here's some more code here. We have uh, an int object that we created, and then we have a reference to it. Again, using the colon colon operator, you can create a reference to a property just the same way as you create a, a reference to a function. And then there are different ways that we can actually call the getter on this property. So uh, this is where we get the instance, and this boils down at the Java level into a getter and a setter for this thing. So we have the private field and the getter and the setter. And then we've got this uh, reference, which ends up being a reference to this, again, this static class that it created. So it creates a, an instance of the static class, and it has the get and the set method. So this is how properties work in Kotlin. Obviously, you have get and set that you can re-implement, and those are essentially implemented on top of the getter and setter that was compiled at the Java level that we saw earlier. So there are different ways that you can call this thing. You could do a direct reference to it. You could uh, call it with empty parentheses here, or you can call invoke. Both of these are essentially the same exact thing. Uh, so it calls into that instance that we saw earlier. And this is what the call stack looks like. This is where I needed to actually put a breakpoint in and say, what happened? How did I get here? Well, we got into the get uh, through this very tiny call stack. It called into that evoke in the uh, instance of that static class that we saw, and then invoke directly called get. So it's all very good. It's, it's very low overhead for this thing, except for the creation of that, uh, that instance of the inner class that we saw. Uh, call, on the other hand, is a bit weirder, right? So it, uh, first of all, does an auto-boxing into this object array, and then it ends up in this call stack, much, much longer. And the, the key thing you should note here is the one right ab above the bottom, that method call. It's a native call. This basically is using uh, the Java reflection mechanism of going down into native, taking the information you gave it about, you know, a string name for the method name and all this information, the parameters, and then up calling and maybe erroring out because you called it with a no wrong number of parameters. It doesn't do any type checking on any of that stuff. It just says, yep, I'm going to call a thing, and then let's see what happens. Um, so in general, even though you can use call, you kind of shouldn't, right? It's not type safe, and it's very easy to cause a runtime error instead. And oh, by the way, there's a lot more overhead for using it. So invoke or just direct invocation, which ends up in invoke instead, is a better way to go. All right, so all of that stuff is about reflection and about properties. Now I want to talk about property delegation. All right, so here's a simple way that you can use property delegation. You're basically saying, I'll have a property, but instead of uh, having a get set directly, you know, implicitly or directly in the code, I want to actually use another object. So whenever get and set are called on this thing, I want you to call this other class over here, and I'm going to pass in an instance. So here's this int cache class that I created. I have a private uh, backing field there, and then I have a get set, and this is the contract that you have the get set, right? You have these methods that you must implement. They are going to be called, and then you do whatever you need to do to return the value of that property from this delegated class that you created. So there's a couple of weird things going on here. One is, why is the instance of the class that holds the property being passed in? Like, I don't need that. I have a backing field. I could just return that. Like, why are you giving this, me this information? Also, this property, this K property object that's passing in. Again, I don't need this information. I know what's going on with my backing field, so uh, what is all this stuff for? 
So we're going to take a look at both of these. The first one, I believe, is kind of informational, like maybe you're doing something more complicated in calculating the value that either you're storing or you're returning, and maybe it's handy to know where it's coming from to get context. So I wrote a small example. Um, so in this case, if you're setting the value, if you're, if you're setting the amount of chocolate that you have purchased, and uh, this information is stored in specific classes that are either white or dark or milk, then you can automatically take that amount and you can recalculate it into something more realistic. For example, if you bought white chocolate, that is not chocolate at all, and so you should store a value of zero. If you bought milk chocolate, that's obviously not as good as dark chocolate, therefore you're going to store less, right? So this is, you know, it, it's a bit of a contrived, no, it's a very contrived example, but you can actually use the information being passed in to store something more intelligent uh, than simply the value that's passed in and retrieved later. For the property, this one gets interesting. Property delegation is used by other language and library facilities that Kotlin has, and so they created this generic mechanism for property delegation overall so that it could be used in all these different situations, one of which is uh, observable properties. So the observable properties work by saying, uh, essentially you're saying, I want to give you an observer that's going to be called later when this property changes, and it uses that property value. So this is essentially why this parameter exists, because if you're actually using property delegation for an observer, then it is going to use that property and then pass it back to your listener along the way. So here's how you might declare this thing. You're saying, I want to observe changes to this thing here, and it's going to call you later, and it's going to pass in the reference to the property itself, as well as the old and the new values, and you can do with it what you want, but it basically needed that K property thing to be passed through the property delegation mechanism so that it could hand it back to you later. So the fact that I had it also as an argument to my int cache, and also if I do lazy stuff, like none of those things actually need this, but another mechanism that uses property delegation needs it, so that's why it's there in general. All right. So we have this delegated property by int cache. Uh, we can look at what this looks like at the Java level. Um, there's something else weird going on, right? So we have this int cache reference. That's great. That's where I have uh, the things stored that are actually going to do the, the gets and the sets on this thing in my other delegated object. Um, but along the way, it's going to create this thing, right? This delegated properties array. So it's creating two objects on my behalf. One is a K property itself, a reference to the property. And then there's the array that it's storing this thing in. Um, so the question is, why is it creating this thing, right? Why do I have these objects being created on my behalf? Uh, so, uh, oh, nope, nope, nope. Let's go back. Sorry. I meant to explain that, which is, the deal is Java doesn't know what a property is, right? We can't say, oh, and by the way, pass in a property, because when this gets compiled into Java programming language code, it doesn't know what a property is. So instead, the array is created because, well, it's going to have to be passed to these Kotlin objects later using a mechanism that Java doesn't have, right? So instead, we're going to basically put it in the array, and then we can reference these objects in the array instead. So all Java has is like a private field and getter and setter. Um, but it now has this static array that it creates as well, and then it can create references, or it can use the references in the array to pass around uh, to observe the contract that we have for property delegation elsewhere in Kotlin. All right, finally, onto the lazy example. So this is from the, the prequel to this talk. So now how do we get here? So we have this lazy mechanism. It's a really convenient way to avoid creating expensive objects until you actually need them. Maybe you don't need them at all in case it was a waste of effort. Um, in, in this case, so there was an example um, from an engineering team where someone said, well, there's this really convenient lazy mechanism. I really don't want to create this rect object, so why don't I use by lazy instead? It's just one line of code. How expensive can it be? Wouldn't it be nice to avoid the creation of an object and four ints? So they said, OK, I'll do rect by lazy, and then if, in fact, I need this object, we'll go ahead and create the rect. So what that does is it creates that object I was talking about, that weird uh, property delegate array. So it's going to create a K property referring to that thing and the array to hold the K property. It's also going to create this lazy object, uh, and that's going to be initialized. So one of them, that's just, you know, the delegated, the property array, that was just a static thing. It's created once for the class. That's fine. Uh, the lazy is created once per instance of the property. Uh, and then we have the get value, this, this function that's going to actually retrieve the value. The good thing about this is this is a way that it can avoid actually using Java reflection. So it can call into methods to get information instead of going down through that really 
uh, a complex call mechanism to, to get all this stuff. Um, but this ends up being this method with a few conditions as well as synchronized blocks just to get the value. So we basically step through all of this work to avoid creating a rect. We created a K property object, we created an array to hold that object, we created the lazy object itself, and we're going through this synchronized value instantiation all to avoid creating a single rect object, which I think is pretty darn lazy. So the interesting thing is, on the way here, Romain was uh, looking at the JetBrains blog, and um, they... I think they heard, they, they heard that we were giving this talk and they got scared and they, they rushed to make a press release <laughs> yes. to prove they, us wrong. They must have seen an early copy of our slides. They've been monitoring us. Okay, so in the JetBrains blog, as of December 6th, Svetlana wrote this what to expect in Kotlin 1.4. Uh, which has the following language in it. Starting with Kotlin 1.4, when you define a lazy property, the corresponding K property instance won't be generated. If the only delegated properties used in a class are lazy properties, the whole delegated properties array won't be generated for the class. So all the stuff that I just complained about, like why are we passing around properties to lazy objects that don't need it, or to my delegated properties that really want to ignore this stuff, isn't that a lot of overhead? And what's the, with this weird uh, the delegate array that we just saw? Apparently, other people agree with this, and if uh, the, the delegated property doesn't actually need that, sure, the observable property may, but if lazy doesn't need it, then why should it be there at all? So apparently a future version of Kotlin will address this. So, yeah, that's what I said at the beginning, things will change. All right, next I want to talk about D8 and R8. How many people in the room are Android developers? All right, pretty much everyone. Good, that will make things easier. Uh, so D8 and R8 are two uh, compilers for Android. So with Android, when we use the, the Java programming language or Kotlin, we first compile the code to, to JVM bytecode. But the runtime on Android called Art does not consume this bytecode. Instead, it consume, consumes something called Dex. So D8 is a tool that will take this JVM bytecode and convert it to the Android bytecode called Dex. Uh, R8 is, you can see it as a replacement for ProGuard. It's always often seen as a minifier or shrinker. It will make your app smaller, but it's also a fantastic optimizer for your app. Because what R8 can do is it can look at your entire app. It will look at the entire jar or the entire DEX file for, for the app and can uh, implement optimizations that would not be possible otherwise. And we're going to see, we're going to take a look at some of them. Um, so typically, the way you use R8 uh, to, to optimize your application or minify it or shrink it is this way. In your build.gradle, you say minify enabled true, uh, and then you can specify a ProGuard file. So R8 is compatible with the ProGuard rules. So if you want to customize the rules, you can create your own file. But we have a set of rules by default. This is not very useful for this talk. This is what you're going to do when you want to publish your application. But if you want to look at what R8 actually does, what kind of optimizations it enables, uh, we need to do it differently. So first of all, go to your terminal, clone uh, this. Uh, it's called Depot Tools. Uh, I don't know, something that comes from Chrome. Uh, we need it for another project. So you put that on your path, then you clone the R8 repository, and R8 needs this depot, depot tools uh, um, binary uh, to work. So then you go into the R8 directory, and you call this gradle.python uh, script, and you say gradle.py uh, R8D8, and it's going to compile R8 and D8. Um, and then we're going to put those into this R8 home, home and we'll be uh, able to use R8 and D8 from the command line. So don't worry too much about this. Uh, I'm sure we'll publish the slides, the video will be there, so if you want to do this yourself, uh, take a look at it later. So then, how do we use D8 and R8 uh, from the command line? So first, you need to compile your application. So here I'm compiling all the KT files in my current directory. I compile them to a jar file, and also add this dash include runtime. This is very important for R8 to be able to do its job. It can only optimize things that are part of your application. So make sure that you include the standard library of Kotlin as part of the application. Uh, then you do all of this. Uh, don't bother too much about understanding what it does. This is basically just calling D8 and saying, OK, here's my Android.jar with the platform APIs. This is my standard library from Kotlin. And uh, in the current directory, you, have, you can find all my class files. Please uh, generate the, the decks from that. If you want to use, call, to use R8, uh, it's very similar. Instead of d8.jar, use r8.jar. Then you can also specify this dash dash pg dash conf. That's the, a, the path to the ProGuard file that contains you know, all the, the features you may want to use from ProGuard. And finally, very importantly, uh, 
we want to be able to look at the output of R8. And like I said, R8 and D8 will compile your uh, JVM bytecode to DEX bytecode, so we cannot use the decompilers that we talked about earlier, because those work only on JVM bytecode. So R8, uh, thankfully, comes with its own disassembler. Uh, there's another one in the Android SDK called DEX dump. Uh, I find the, the output of R8 uh, to be a little friendlier, uh, so I recommend to use this one. So use the r8.jar, you pass the disassem uh, uh, argument. Um, dash dash smiley, uh, smiley, sorry, changes the format of the output. So it comes from an open source project called smiley, which is an assembler uh, for DEX bytecode. Uh, again, I find it easier to read, so you know, use those arguments, and you specify the path to your DEX file. OK, finally, here's an example of what r8 can do. So I have this very simple program. I have a main function I call string length. This is a, a function I created. It takes a string and prints to the command line uh, the length of the string. So if we compile this, compile this with the 8, uh, we get this code. So first, uh, Kotlin is going to do a null check because my string length function uh, uh, receives a non-null parameter. So Kotlin wants to make sure that the parameter is not null. That's fine. Uh, then we call the length method on the string. And finally, we output the length uh, in, in the console using println. Uh, now, this is the code that gets generated by R8 instead. So you can see that the null check is gone. The call to my string length function is gone. Uh, there's only this uh, print and this other, um, this other operation, so this const. So what R did is it saw that we had this constant string that I was passing to my function. Um, it inlined the function string length, and because the string itself is constant and it knows it's not null, it got rid of the null check. And again, because the string is constant, it knows the length of the string, so it got rid of the call to length, and it just put the length of the string directly on the stack in the program. So my function is gone, the null check is gone, everything's gone. So this so is the kind of stuff that Ari does. As long as your strings are always length 11, this should work really well. <laughs> All right, so here's something that's more Kotlin specific that Ari can do. It's called lambda merging. So let's say we have a higher order function. So I have this compute function that takes a lambda, it does something, and then at some point it invokes the lambda. And this is how I use this higher order, high order function from my main function. So I have my arguments that come from the command line. I call compute twice. I have two different lambdas. And those two lambdas have compatible shapes. That means they take the same arguments, they take no arguments, and they have the same capture. They both capture the args string array that comes from the command line. So when you compile that with Kotlin C and we look at the, the, the generated code, it looks like this. Uh, uh, both of the lambdas are instantiated as from classes that have been generated by the compiler. So I have this my lambda one and my lambda two. The instances are passed to my compute function. And if you look at the implementation of those two generated classes, they look like this. They, they, again, they look the same. They have the same shape. They both extend the lambda class. They both implement function zero. That means they receive no parameter. Uh, both of their constructors take the same capture. It's this, this string array that's the arguments to the program. The only thing that, that, that's different between those two, uh, uh, those two classes is the invoke function. It contains the actual body of my lambdas. Now, if you run that through R8, what R8 will do is merge all those lambdas into a single class, because the problem is that every time you generate an, uh, an additional class in your application, it's going to increase you know, load times. It's more classes that have to be loaded. It's more initialization. Uh, and you know, when you do that thousands or dozens of thousands of times, it could uh, affect the startup time of your application. So, so R8 will take those two lambdas and group them into the single class called a lambda group. It still implements function 0. And if you look at the constructor, it still takes uh, a single capture. Uh, so it's an object, because you know, it could, the different lambdas could, uh, could have different types for the capture. But it also has this extra parameter called ID. And if you look at the invoke function, it's just a switch statement over this ID. And we have the implementation of all the bodies of all of our lambdas in the same place. Um, and what's really cool with R8 is that it has a number of optimizations, so lambda merging, but it can also do the constant folding and inlining and a number of things, and it combines all those optimizations together. So if we write our compute function, function our high order function, to be simple enough, in this case, I just print the, 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 the return value of the lambda, uh, R8 will inline everything. And so that code, where we start you know, two extra classes, we're instantiating the classes, we're calling the function, with R8 becomes this. Everything's gone, everything's been in line, the classes are gone, the instances are gone, we're not even calling functions anymore, we just have the results directly. Uh, next, we have staticization. Um, 
So what does that mean? So here's a very simple example. I have a data class. It's a matrix. So it's a two by two matrix. It has four floats, but it has a companion object because I wanted. There's no static functions uh, in Kotlin. So instead, what you do is you create a companion object on the class. And here, I added a method to my companion object. It's the identity method, and it returns the identity matrix. If we look at the generate code, um, our matrix class looks exactly like we expect, but there's all that added craft for the companion object. So first of all, there's a static instance called companion and of a type called matrix.companion. Companion. So it's a new inner class that has been generated. There's a static initialization block that will fill that, that field. And finally, we have our inner class, and there we can find our identity method. So once again, uh, just because I wanted to have this uh, static, you know, basically static function, my identity function, we generated a new class, which will increase you know, class load times and initialization. It could slow down the application when you do it enough. Uh, and if you look at the call site, so if this, if this is the way that I invoke my identity function, uh, the equivalent generated Java code looks like this. So instead of calling matrix.identity, we call matrix.companion.identity. So if we go back to the generated code and we run it through R8, what R8 will do is this. It will get rid of everything, move the identity method from the companion object to the, to the enclosing class as a static function, and then the companion object doesn't need to exist anymore, so it just gets rid of it. So we got rid of that class. And again, if we go back to how we use that, that function, uh, we went from this uh, to, to this in Java. Uh, and again, because R8 can combine a bunch of optimizations, if uh, R8 decides to inline uh, everything, then the static functions can even, can even disappear, and you just, you're just left with the allocation of the matrix directly at the call site. Uh, to achieve the same, you might be tempted to use the add JVM static annotation. Um, it will, in a way, produce the same thing. You will have a static function that you can use from Java. The problem is the implementation. Uh, this is what it looks like. So I do have my static uh, function on the matrix class, and it's called identity. But all it does, it calls into the companion object. So we still have the companion class, and we still have all the added uh, overhead. Uh, next optimization, that one is not specific to Kotlin, uh, but it, it is an important one. It's called, uh, it's related to enum mapping. So we talked about this in the prequel to our talk, but I will remind you if you haven't seen it. Um, so let's say we have an enum class. We have this blend mode. Uh, it has four different values. And somewhere in my code, I just have a switch statement over the different values of the enum. It doesn't really matter what the switch statement does. But if you look at the generated code, it looks like this. The switch is not on the values themselves. It's not on the ordinal of the enum. It's, uh, it takes the ordinal of the enum and uses that to index into an array, and that array is called enum switch mapping, and it's part of a new class called when mappings. And then finally, we have the, the different branches. So if we look at the generated class, it looks like this. Uh, it's, so it's a new class, there's an array, and then in the static initialization block, uh, we put those constants into the array based on the ordinals of the enum values. So you have to do this to preserve binary compatibility with enums. Uh, and this is really important when you build libraries. But this is exactly the kind of situation where R8 shines, because it can optimize the, remember, it optimizes the entire application. So there's no binary compatibility issues. Uh, and the, the, the thing here is like here we see one array, and we see like, you know, the initialization for that one array. But what happens is that every time you write a switch on an enum, it's going to add a new array. So it's going to have you know, longer initialization time, and you have decided class, and so on. So now if we go back to the originally uh, generated code by the Kotlin compiler, and we run it through R8, we're left with this instead. So again, the class is gone, the initialization is gone, we don't have the array, we just do what we would expect. Uh, finally, we want to talk about loops. Uh, again, we mentioned that in our previous talk. Uh, just wanted to go over it again. So here's a very simple loop. We go from you know, 0 to 10, and we just print all those numbers. Uh, and if I compile that uh, through D8, and I look at the size of the file, I have this classes.dex, and it's about one kilobyte. Sounds about appropriate for, for an Android app. And then I'm going to make a very small change to my loop. So I don't want to print all the numbers. I want to print, to print every other number. So the way you do this is you use step. So I say step two. Uh, I recompile. And now if I look at the text file, uh, it's 4.6 kilobytes. It's four times bigger. All I did was say increment by two instead of incrementing by one. So what is going on? That first step is a doozy. <laughs> so let's decompile the code. Uh, it doesn't fit on the slide, so I have to scale it down. 
uh, and this is what it looks like. So it creates an in progression object. It contains an int range. And you can see that they're all constant values. So you know, we go from 0 to 10. There's this step of 2. And then you call get first, which is 0. Like it should know that. It calls get last, and that's 10. And get step, that's 2. And then you have this while loop and all those conditions. And somewhere in the middle, you have the content of the for loop uh, where we do the, the print line. And you know, that's fine. Uh, what's a little weird, though, is that if you go back to the, to, the, to the for loop and you make a very small cell change and you step by one, which would be the equivalent of not stepping at all, you still get the same amount of code generated. Um, so the compiler is not being super clever here. Uh, and unfortunately, R8 does not optimize that away. Uh, I know that the R8 team is somewhere uh, here at this conference, so hopefully they will hear us and fix it in a future version. Uh, that's all we have for you today. Uh, I just wanted to thank so Jesse Wilson. The idea of looking at the assert function in Kotlin came from a blog post that Jesse Wilson wrote. Uh, so you know, all the credit goes to him, uh, and also Jack Wharton who gave us a bunch of ideas of things to look at. Also, that optimization on the string thing, right? Uh, no, so yeah, Jack. So the optimization of, uh, of R8, uh, knowing about the length of a string and putting that as a constant in your bytecode, uh, Jack implemented that, and then of course we have the R8 team who did a fantastic job on R8. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. If you have any. Or there's lunch. Just toss that out there. Lunch, bytecode, lunch. All right. Okay. Thank you.